you very much. I hope you can hear me well. I promised in the pause that I would use the microphone in a good way. Yeah? Good. <clears throat> yes, indeed. So I've been working on different topics. Um, and this was quite new to me, I must admit. So um, for those of you now that feel what is geo, uh, micro uh, sorry, geotextiles, I will uh, tell you. So, of course, as uh, has been mentioned already, geotextiles is a potential source of microplastics, um, unintentional emissions to the environment. And since this has been under investigation by the commission and there was this um, open public consultation, these questions also reached the Swedish EPA. Uh, they probably felt that they didn't know that much about it. And that was one of the reasons that they initiated this study. Um, and uh, they also wanted to, as a part of an ongoing assignment that they have for the government, where they try to map plastic flows, to just know what plastics is used where. So we got this uh, study, and it is really to, to find as much information as possible on this topic. So what is it? The composition of it, which kind of uh, polymers is it? The quantities, what's, when it becomes waste, what's done with it? How is it used? Are there alternatives that are not made of plastics? And of course, the risks and the microplastics emissions. And we did a literature study then, and also combined with interviews to try to, to answer these questions. And to the right here, you see the actual definition from a standard of what a uh, geotextile is. But actually, I think it's easier to try to look at the picture. There you can see it in action. And that's a really typical use case uh, on, on the ground in, in some kind of major construction work, maybe a road, a train, or um, a building, you use it on the ground to separate materials and for filtration and drainage purposes. And these big rolls of um, plastics are used on the ground. Um, but it's a polyvaric um, textile material and it may be non-woven, knitted or woven and it's used in, in contact with soil. So that is the uh, definition of it. So, what did we find? Well, first off, when it comes to the polymers, then, uh, even though there are, some, as you can see, these numbers don't add up <laughs> completely, but what we can say is that polypropylene PP is the absolute major um, use polymer. Um, depending on who you ask, uh, and maybe a little bit of different also in where in the world you, you um, look, um, you get different numbers, but uh, definitely above 90% of all. Then you have uh, PET, uh, PE, and PA also. And the question, if there are alternatives, yes, there are natural um, geotextiles, um, <coughs> for example, made out of jute, or flax, or choir, so coconut fibers, but these are not used to any great extent. And I suspect, at least, that these, this number, even though I'm not completely sure, is uh, on a more global level. I don't think that is used very much at all in Sweden. Um, and the reason for that is also because they are degradable. And much of the purpose for this is to have something really, a stable material that is, allows uh, stable constructions and so on. So you don't really, at least that's how, how um, we reason, you don't want the stability. Um, so sorry, you, you want the stability, so you don't want to use these degradable alternatives. There are, however, uses where this could be useful. Um, we mentioned some of them in the report, but it's, for example, in, in some erosion or slopes where you could actually have this the material uh, disintegrate and, and provide a really good environment for, for plants, for example, and then uh, when they've taken over the erosion protection through the roots and so on, you don't need this anymore. So that, that would be a good use. So approximately uh, 15,000 tons of geotextiles is, is sold every year, or used every year in Sweden. Um, and in Europe, that number is approximately 164 to 193,000 tons. And geotextiles is just a part of the geosynthetics family, but it's um, definitely a major part of it. So the other geosynthetics um, that are used, there are different nets and mats and a lot of different applications 
and they are considerably less than only 6%. And I, I said that uh, these can be non-woven, noven, or knitted, and so on, but as you can see here, it's an uh, absolute majority that are the, the non-woven kind. So the market size, yeah, I just mentioned it here, so it's quite a big market, even though I don't have anything to compare it with, um, and it's also growing. So this is an area that when you talk to people in this field, that there's definitely a, a growth, and the, the use is, is more and more common in, yeah, in, in different construction projects. And the definitely the most common application is in this for separation and filtration purposes. Um, and then we have the hydraulic applications. I think this was already mentioned uh, by Mr. Bosmung. Uh, that this number is something we got from the industry. So it's approximately 7% of the total EE market. And hydraulic applications is when you use it in, in contact with water. Um, and also there's a consumer use. You can buy these at, uh, at uh, your local place where you buy construction materials. Maybe use it in your, in your garden for some reason. And it's estimated to approximately 10%. We tried to, to find some information on the history. When was this, when did this start? Um, that was not really successful. I mean, at least not in, in terms of numbers or figures. But um, the ones interviewed, they were quite um, aligned in saying that it really took, um, it really started to, to gain a, a traction in, in the 80s and 90s. So since then, at least, and it's been increasing since. But the first, the, it has been used earlier than that as well. So one thing about these is that they are construction products, and they fall under the construction products regulation. And this also means that there are harmonized standards that regulate how, how these are must be manufactured, and they are CE-labeled. These harmonized standards, they, they do require some testing um, to make sure that they are durable. So for example, weathering testing and oxidation resistance. And depending on the results from these tests, they do get a, a, service, um, a service life assigned to them, so 25, 50, or 100 years. And it seems like the 100 years is the most common. Um, and how the, the way you assign this year is also by doing these tests, performing them, exposing them, and then having strength retention tests. So depending on how much strength is left in the, in the textile, um, you get a, um, a certain year. And that is not seen as a guarantee, but it's, yeah, it, it, it's a technical lifetime. There's nothing, as far as we found, that is related to microplastics in this. No requirements at all. And it's not looked at. And this middle picture is just to show you that there are different standards depending on different usages. Um, but as far as I can tell, I think I read through most of them at least, the, the testing is, is very similar. There is a, another test also for this hydraulic applications. It's a ISO standard. It's not uh, yet a harmonized standard, so it's not a requirement, but it's performed in certain um, um, countries at least, for example, Germany where you have abrasion testing while so that could contribute to some information but again um, microplastics is not a part of that so when we can come to the to the waste question um, it's not not much of this has become waste yet so much most of it is already in use I and mean, it's still in use that that has been put in the in the ground so there's not much experience in waste handling. Um, so most likely when you dig this up, it's incinerated or in some certain cases, perhaps landfilled. It is possible to recycle it, at least in theory, but the industry members that we talked to, they haven't really developed it. There's been no pressure also for them to do it. Um, and we could also uh, mention here that it's not really allowed. If you put it in, you can only use it for certain lower requirements things here, like the, and give it a five-year service life. So post-consumer uh, material, post-industrial materials only used for certain, could only be used in for certain applications, which makes it less attractive also for the industry, I think, to, to pursue this. So when it comes to degradation and risk factors, there is a lot of 
degradation factors that can affect the, these textiles, um, their strength, and these are also synergistic. They, they act together. So it seems, however, that UV exposure is really the most important one. Um, but it, there's also, of course, abrasion, chemical degradation, hydrolysis, or biological degradation, to some extent at least. And they all interact. Um, so there are really, you must, <laughs> according to the instructions from the manufacturing, according to this test and the standards, you should cover them after a certain period of time that is laid down in the standards uh, for them to, to keep their, um, to be able to, to have that service life. But during the interviews we have with the people in the construction industry, they didn't really know about this all, all the time. So it means that sometimes, like in this picture, they are, remain uncovered and in the sunlight, which with them will uh, lessen their strength and uh, make them weaker. Um, however, um, the relationship between that kind of degradation factors and microplastic formation is I mean, it's not clear at all. We don't know anything about it, to be honest. We didn't find anything. Uh, we do know that certain, there has been a findings at least of um, fragments of geotextiles in, in the Baltic Sea along, along the coast, but it's not much in the literature that has really shown that, that uh, microplastics that we found have a geotextiles as a source. So there's really uncertainty about what really happens with this then. Yes, you have tested the laboratory, but what happens in the actual environment after 100 years, no one knows. Also, because even the, the oldest ones haven't been in the environment for that long. So we had to um, make some assumptions to be able to calculate some possible emissions. And we had a maximum scenario, and we had a lower scenario. And I mean, to be honest, this is just our estimations. We used this 20% um, incorrect handling, that meaning that yeah, 20% wouldn't really know about this and keep it in, in the sun or uh, too long and not covering it. And that would halve its lifetime, for example. And also hydraulic applications that it would, the abrasion would also lead to, to a mass loss of 20% during its lifetime. And in the lower scenario, this is considerably less. So with these two scenarios, we, we calculated um, what we think is the emission and you can see here the range from the lower to the, the maximum amount. And this increases really a lot. And the reason for that is the that we assume that there's a disintegration after the service life, life has been reached. So when you reach, for example, 2080, then mo most of uh, the, the geotextiles has reached its 100 year lifetime. And we don't really know what happens with it. We have assumed that it disintegrates. It could last longer. Someone mentioned 300 years, perhaps 400 years. We don't know. But even so, it would happen in the future. So there would be, I mean, as long as it lies there, it probably will integrate and disintegrate in the future. So what we could conclude then was that Right now, at least with our estimation uh, assumptions, it doesn't appear to be a large source of microplastics, especially compared to the other sources that were discussed today, like uh, tire uh, road wear and uh, paints. But it could very well become so in the future, especially since this is also accumulating. We use the, all these tons every year. We just, it, they enter more and more into the environment. But it's definitely clear that not enough is known about the relationship between degradation and strength loss and microplastic formation. So how this uh, relationship looks like, that would be really interesting to be able to, to refine also our assumptions. So that's definitely needed more research in, in that area. Um, and there's a lack of studies also looking at direct release of, from geotextiles of fibers of particles. So no, it seems like no one has really looked at that as well. And uh, another obstacle in a way is also if you would like to look at this on site in the soil where it has been lying for some time, how would you go about to measure that? There seems to be difficulties really to, to measure it in soil samples. So that uh, may also need to be developed. Thank you. <laughs>